so all these people here uh, gathered are, are members or regular uh, attendees, so I will not uh, uh, introduce them all. Um, so welcome everybody to this coffee house uh, conducted by the Alliance of Just Money. Uh, I'm your host and moderator tonight. My name is Govert Schuller, yeah, for the Germans. <laughs> But I'm of Dutch extraction. Uh, my ancestors, nine generations uh, back, uh, came to uh, Amsterdam to study uh, uh, medicine, and uh, their their uh, uh, their children and children's children all stayed in Holland, except for a few. They said, "Okay, let's go to the United States." Uh, just. For those who are new here, um, the Alliance promotes uh, monetary reform, um, monetary literacy. For that, we got our big uh, website where you can find all kinds of information about our theory, but also our reform. Um, we're, we're kind of riding on the waves of AMI, the American Monetary Institute, to change the money system through legislation. And that comes from the NEED Act that uh, uh, Stefan Zarlenga of the AMI has worked so hard on. So um, we're, we're entangled very much with that organization and its, uh, its goals. I do just a little uh, introduction. We're getting to be recorded then at this moment. And I'm just calling out the people that I have not yet seen or heard of. So first, Pamela Haynes wrote this. <laughs> toward a right relationship with finance, debt, interest, growth, and security with some other people. I don't know if you can read it. So that's why we are very excited to have her on. Thank you. <laughs> a published author uh, in the open committed to monetary reform. I'm friends with Ed Dreeby for many years. So good. very good cool. company there. Then I see Margaret Rao. Hello, Margaret. Welcome. I just unmuted myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, tonight's topic is, uh, well, the title, The Political Economy of German Savings Banks. And that will be conducted by Dr. Mark Castle, who happens also to be, and I have to thank him for that, that he let him uh, be our intern. Uh, he's a professor also of Benjamin Renninger, who is here. There's a young man waving at us. <laughs> oh. Wonderful guy, very productive. Um, uh, actually, we're writing together a paper uh, uh, with formula and numbers and symbols and mm -hmm. really deep, weird stuff. Um, <laughs> You'll, you'll hear about us. Um, I'll let, I'll let uh, Mr. Castle talk about these, uh, 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 the Sparkasse. Um, I think in Dutch, it would be also something like savings boxes, something like that, if you want to uh, translate it literally. Anyway, we'll hear about that. Uh, before we continue some rules of the road tonight, um, please refrain from using the chat feature during the presentation. It's a bit um, distracting and it's not very respectful to the presenter. But when we go into questions and answers, you know, uh, use the chat as you like. Um, also, when we go into question and answer mode, um, use the raise your hand system. So at the bottom of your screen, you will find a smiley face slightly on the right with a plus on it, meaning that if you click on it, you'll get more choices. And of the choices, it's the raise hand choice that will go with tonight if you have a question. So, and that will show up like this as I'm doing here, and then you can go back and then you have your choice of lower the hand. And Stephen Walsh has it up, but <laughs> he's just playing with this. Uh, and uh, we'll try to keep it in, in uh, chronological order uh, uh, with the question and the answers, and then we'll see how it goes. Um, I found that we have a new feature, uh, but you can also turn that off. So I don't know if people saw that there are subtitles. If you go to, again, at the bottom of your screen to where it says more and click on that, then the top item says, you know, show or don't show subtitles. 
I know that Americans hate subtitles <laughs> and therefore are not watching enough uh, uh, foreign movies. <laughs> <laughs> So it's up to you to, to keep that on or, or not. Excellent, folks, having said that, uh, welcome, Dr. Castle. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so, so much um, to all of you for giving me the chance to talk a little bit about Spakas and about public banking uh, generally. Um, do your speakers sometimes use presentations? I'm not, I'm not sure. Is that something that, you, that has been done in the past? I wasn't. All right, I'm gonna. I'm not. I, I'm not an entirely experienced um, Zoom presenter or using it, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna try. Put a few things together that I think will be helpful. But if it doesn't work, I'm also happy to just freeform it. So let me. Let me see if I can share my screen, and and we'll see how it goes. Oops. There we go. Um, I think that's working. Is that working? Okay. So anyway, let me um, again just say thanks for giving me the chance to to talk uh, about Germany's system of, of public savings banks, known as Sparkassen, and again just a little bit generally about about public banking. So I, I suspect some of you know something about Sparkassen or know something about Germany's public savings banks, but maybe not all of you. And so let me just give you a little bit of a um, just a primer on, on what uh, public savings banks are. So Sparkassen are for-profit, uh, local, uh, independent, independently managed banks that, that are um, set up to serve um, local communities um, uh, and are governed and are held accountable by local stakeholders, typically um, mayors or county executives or some combination as well as employees. Um, they're public banks, but I don't, I don't think of them as being publicly owned banks um, in the sense that they, they're really in some ways a little bit like, um, kind of like a county fire department, if you will, um, in the sense that like local governments, um, you know, they oversee their, their fire department or their sheriff department or their police department, but they don't really sell them, right? They, so they, it, it isn't owned in the sense that they can just sell off their county fire department. Um, and so Spachhausen really sort of fit, uh, fit that. At the same time, they are financial institutions um, and they are in, the, in a very traditional sense. Um, they're sort of, in some ways, I think, I like to think of them as as like savings and loans pre-deregulation from the 1980s, coupled with kind of a CDFI certification, sort of a, a community financial, uh, community development financial institute certification. So um, as I said, they're for-profit uh, institutions. They take deposits, um, they make loans, they compete with cooperatives and they compete with private banks. Um, at the same time, they have to follow the same regulations that any bank does in Germany, including Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank, the large commercial banks. And, you know, their business model is remarkably boring. Um, they make loans, they take deposits, and they exist on the difference in the interest rates. Um, and they keep their loans. They don't sell their loans on a secondary mortgage market. Um, um, and also, um, like pre 1980s savings and loans, public savings banks are really constrained in a lot of ways in how they do, can do business. Um, so they, for example, are uh, constrained to doing only business in their particular region. Um, and at the same time, their mission uh, includes a kind of a public good component. Um, so, for example, they're prohibited, as I said, from doing business outside their region and their mission includes, for example, promoting asset building or asset wealth building in their region or ensuring financial inclusion. And I just give you one great story to sort of illustrate that. So I've been working on this for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, Germany not that long ago was, was dealing with a refugee crisis. Um, millions of refugees were coming into um, Europe from places like Syria and Afghanistan. And Germany was taking a lot of them. Um, and refugees pose a particular problem to financial institutions, right? I mean, they don't often have great ID. They don't have 
they have enormous needs, but and and the public sector wants to provide for a lot of those uh, social services, but it's not easy um, to to provide um, you know bank accounts uh, in the traditional way. And for those of you who may or may not know, Germany's entire social safety net system relies on banks. It's a bank country, and everything that you get uh, from the state. And frankly, everything, most things you get from private actors all flow through banks. And so for the government and for the country, it was a real problem. How to deal with refugees if you want to provide them food um, subsidies, housing subsidies, all those sorts of things. And private banks and cooperatives, for, the, for example, were largely unwilling to deal with the hassle and the, um, the, the challenges that are associated with providing refugees with um, with bank accounts, Sparkassen, however, public savings banks, um, however, were required. That was part of their mission. That was part of their charge. That's what makes them Sparkassen. And so, um, one of the reasons that the refugee crisis turned out to be less of a crisis was in large measure because of Sparkassen's requirement, um, public mission, really, to provide um, financial services for everyone, including refugees just to give you one small example. And so these are um, savings banks that are located throughout the country. There, there are 376 savings banks located across 13,000 branches. Um, uh, just to give you, I think I, there we go. Just to give you one small taste, I, I don't mean to sort of, <laughs> I know it's a little bit disorienting to skip things, but this gives you a little bit of a sense um, this is sort of the larger map, and let me just uh, um, sort of close in a little bit to give you a sense. So each one of these little spaces here, one of these little jurisdictions represents a jurisdiction in which you have a savings bank. And then with each, when each of, within each of those, you've got several savings, you've got a number of savings bank branches, just to give you a sense of how the system is organized. So they're highly decentralized. They're located through basically in every county in, uh, in Germany. Um, you know, when you, if you visit Germany um, and you particularly go to small towns, you'll typically three, see three institutions. You'll see the, the Bürgerhaus, <laughs> uh, you'll, which is the uh, city hall. You'll see, um, you know, you'll see a church and you'll see a, a, a giant S with a dot over it, the Sparkhausen. Um, and, and frankly, many, many Germans, if not most Germans, almost associate the Sparkasse as a pillar of the local community alongside the government and alongside the church. Let me go back to um, what sets them apart. As I said, what sets savings banks apart is, again, is um, a public mandate that um, was really a public mandate that was very much forged in, in a kind of a crisis. Um, public, public savings banks in Germany are over 200 years old, and they were really very much the product of the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were a product of a time when there was mass migration from rural areas into urban areas, and there was um, all of the challenges uh, that you know industrialization brought to uh, urban areas. And what's interesting is, um, and so at that time, for poor and working class people, um, the only really option that most people had for savings uh, or borrowing was pawn shops. Pawn shops were the major source. Other than that, there wasn't really any place for poor and working class people to park their money safely. Um, local governments uh, came up with uh, Sparkhausen in part because as a kind of a conservative solution, which is sort of interesting. I think a lot of people sort of associate public banks with, the, with the sort of the kind of progressive um, initiative, but at least in Germany, Sparkhausen are very much the product of, of conservative lawmakers who really wanted to bind poor and working class people to the new economy, to the new capitalist economy. Um, and so, uh, as I said, in, um, in the 19th, in the, uh, 19th century, um, uh, you had these new institutions that were created to give uh, poor and working class people a place to park their money, and their mission really was forged in that crisis. They're for profit, as I said. They promote savings and asset building. They ensure financial services. Um, they have to maintain a presence throughout a geographical area. That's really important. They can't just leave an area. 
And to give you one example of that, and we can maybe talk about that a little bit in the Q&A, um, but one of the things that I did, I did a couple of case, four different case studies, two in East Germany and two in West Germany. And what's interesting is that after the wall came down in 1989, all the big private banks went into East Germany um, and set up shop. And within a relatively short period of time, many of you may or may not remember that history, but um, within not that long, East Germany's economy begins to kind of really um, go south. And many of those private banks, uh, particularly the areas where they felt like they couldn't make high enough returns. And the only institutions that really remained were the savings banks. Again, that was in part because of their mission. Last, another one last point I would make about mission, and this might be of interest to a lot of you who are interested in public banking more generally, but their mission also includes um, safeguarding lending to regional en enterprises. In, in other words, they have a very specific mandate to take into account the effects of lending on regional enterprises. So that what that means in practice, and this really comes from the, from the mouths of managers of savings banks, is that a savings bank, in its, if it's deciding uh, whether to provide a loan or the terms of a loan to a business, it can take into account that the impact of that business on the larger economy. That can be part of its equation. And because savings banks are located in that economy, have been in that economy, are the center of relational banking and commerce in that region, they have a really good sense of what impact um, uh, a loan or not getting a loan would have, not just, again, on that institution, on that uh, private firm, but also on the larger economy. Um, what also sets savings, public savings banks apart, as I said, is their regional principle. They're limited to doing business in a particular region. They can't compete with other savings banks. So if you're like a savings bank on Sparkasse in you know, the town of Chemnitz, which is on the Polish-German border, you can't do loans in Frankfurt or in Stuttgart, in the wealthier parts of the country. You are limited. That is your region. And that has really serious implications for the incentives of that savings banks. Because if you're constrained to where you can do business, it means that the savings banks all have a huge incentive and interest in, in making sure that the region's economy grows. Their future, the Spa Cousins' future, is tied directly to the future of that region. Be, by law, <laughs> they can't opt out. Um, the, uh, the third thing that really sets them apart is, again, they're, they're institutions under public law. They're not private actors. Um, and what that really means, among other things, is they can't be sold. They can't go, they can't be merged. They can't be purchased by a private bank or a cooperative. Um, they can't be purchased by another, a foreign bank. They, they are not for sale. Um, and that's what makes them very, very different than lots and lots of institutions. And, and in fact, in interviews, in a lot of interviews that I did with people, I often ask them, why do you have an account with the Schwachhausen? You know, why? These are expensive. These are often expensive. You oftentimes have to pay. It's, it's not cheap. Um, they often don't have the same um, as advantageous terms as a private. And oftentimes they'll say, well, die Sparkasse, die Waschung immer da. The savings banks has always, have always been there. They don't, uh, I had an account and many firms obviously have accounts with multiple different banks and they will often, firms in particular will often say, you know, they're very, uh, will often uh, be very critical of banks that, um, quickly merged with another bank or became another bank and another bank. And for a lot of business people, that's very uncertain. And the one stable thing in their commerce, in their business lives, are the public savings banks, in part because they can't be sold. Um, and lastly, what also sets them apart is their municipal trusteeship. Uh, Sparkhausen, uh, municipal, municipal governments are really trustees of the Sparkhausen. They oversee the Spakas, the public stakeholders, the county executives and mayors and city council people. They serve on a supervisory board. And many of you may or may not be familiar with um, the way this two board system operates, but basically you've got a management board that is run by sort of professional bankers and, and that are hired by a supervisory board. And the supervisory board consists of um, local stakeholders as well as employees, representatives of the savings banks. Um, and so that really sets them apart um, from, uh, from other kinds of financial institutions. And so just that's just sort of a, a broad background. And I want to just turn now to just to tell you what, why I did this and what the puzzle is behind this book um, and this research. Uh, 
So uh, here's the savings banks again. So as I said, um, to me, when I, I spent a lot of time in Germany and um, uh, one of the things that always struck me, I did some work before this with, around uh, the financial crisis and, and public uh, Landesbank in Germany. And what, what surprises me is why public banks in Germany even exist at all, really. Like why, you know, um, these are small financial institutions with comparatively few assets that are nonetheless really the driving engines of Germany's largest economy. Um, they are the most important source of capital for consumers and small and mid-sized enterprises, um, which is in a country which, um, you know, whose economy rests on high skill, export paced, high value added, small mid-sized enterprises. Germany's economy exists because of Sparkassen lending to small and mid-sized enterprises. Um, Sparkassen account for 43% uh, of all business lending and more than half of all consumer lending. lending excuse me. Um, there's no other industrialized economy in the world, let alone an economy the size of Germany that relies as much on small publicly owned financial institutions like Germany. The second puzzle really is um, that their recent experience, that is to say the experience in the, la in the last decade or so, really contradicts two narratives that I'm sure we've all heard, right? Um, in political economy and international political economy. The first narrative is that global pressures and sort of the ascendance of neoliberal ideas will lead to the demise of Germany's unique form of capitalism. Um, that in an era of uh, global financial capitalism, the competitive pressures uh, will force banks to, to uh, grow in size and in breadth. And so smaller institutions like Sparkassen that lack capital, that lack know-how, um, that can't compete, they're gonna be relics of the past. That, um, and so the, you know, and yet Sparkassen are not relics of the past. They're very much a f uh, in the present. Um, they're a central part of Germany's political mo economic model. They embody the country's economic ideas and their democratic principles and self-governance. And, and while savings banks face um, considerable challenges from low interest rates, from efforts by the European Union to standardize banking regulation to global competition, um, Sparkassen continue to provide liquidity uh, even as large commercial banks and state level public banks known as Lundesbank will consolidate and even close. And let me just give you, I'll just show you some data to support that claim. See if I can make it work. There we go. So this is, um, maybe it's too black. I don't know, too dark. This gives you some sense of the lending. This is lending to businesses and self-employed. Um, and what it shows is not only does Sparkassen lending, is Sparkassen's lending to these entities um, greater than um, other kinds of banks, including cooperatives and including large private banks. Um, but what's surprising to me, and I think this is sort of interesting, right, is that if you look at the period um, during and after the financial crisis, Sparkassen's, the difference between, say, private, large private bank lending and Sparkassen lending, it grows. It, it's in, it, that, that gap has grown by a lot. And in fact, one of the things that's sort of interesting is that during the financial, during and after the financial crisis, the Sparkassen's lending, in some ways similar analogous to the Bank of North Dakota, the Sparkassen's lending made up for the losses in lending that was done by um, private banks who either cut back uh, or in some cases consolidated or closed. And so what, what this essentially just says is, look, the narrative is that large private financial institutions are incendent. They will crush small public institutions like Sparkassen, and we don't see it. At least it hasn't existed in Germany. And so that's a puzzle for me. Like, why? Why the, why the hell does that happen? Um, so um, as I said, uh, Sparkassen continued to lend, and they continued to also lend to startup firms. They provided, they were the engine not only of continued growth, that is helping firms that already existed, but they were, they were the major supporter of startups. At the very point when uh, the, globe, the globe's economy as well as Germany's economy was on a downturn. So their 
crucial and they have, and their importance has grown. Um, the, the third puzzle, and the question is why? And the third puzzle um, that drives this research is that, you know, during the recession of 2007, 2008, um, large private and public institutions in Germany and the United States, obviously, uh, they gambled, right? They gambled on mortgage-backed securities and, and opaque derivatives and all kinds of things. And they lost, um, you know, um, smaller publicly owned savings banks um, also suffered in other countries. Like you had places like in Spain, for example, the Cajas also suffered. Um, and in some ways, Spachhausen should have also, <laughs> they should also have uh, struggled. Uh, there's nothing that preve prevented Spachhausen from making the same kinds of bets that other institutions did that lost, um, but they didn't. They opted to keep their lending local. They opted to keep their investments local. Um, and as a result, Spachhausen uh, avoided the, the losses during the financial crisis. And one other thing that I should point out, and I study public administration as well, there's a common belief that, you know, anything and everything in the public is likely to be inefficient and uh, prone to corruption. This should have been the classic case where that happens. If anything, savings banks, which are overseen by local leaders, they should have been especially vulnerable to, um, to uh, the uh, mortgage-backed securities and opaque derivatives uh, crisis, um, but they didn't. And so in some ways, and so in my mind, Germany's public savings banks are really a kind of enigma um, in today's global capitalism. Um, their experience during the past several decades essentially prompted this research. Why? What's going on? Why is it that these institutions that um, uh, continue to lend during the financial crisis largely avoided the corruption that plagued other firms? Um, why have they, and why is it that they were able to survive even as savings banks in other European countries, for the most part, either went away or were transformed into something that made them no longer look like public savings banks? What is it about Germany's public savings banks that allows them to continue um, and survive. Do you want to know? <laughs> yes. All right. I'll take a break, or yes, you want to know? No, we want to know. Okay. Um, the solution to the puzzle. The the argument and um, is really threefold. The um, the, um, the first is economic, right? So the, the first is economic. The, despite expectations to the contrary, um, Spachhausen public savings banks uh, exist because they continue to provide enormous value to firms, to local firms and, lo and um, residential customers, retail customers. Um, in contrast to private banks, um, as I said, state banking laws limit Spachhausen to, uh, to a relatively small area. And again, that regional principle means that Spachhausen are, it's all the, it's the classic um, reasons for relational banking. Spachhausen know their region, they know their firms. And what the reason that, that matters is because that enables the Spachhausen to offer loans at better terms and to make loans that other firms, might, other banks might not otherwise make because they don't have the insider knowledge about those companies. And the other part is, so they make loans, but the other important piece of information and um, that adds value to Spachhausen um, is that they provide a source of information. What does that mean to, to, to firms and businesses? So if businesses go to a Spachhausen for a loan, they have to provide a business plan. That Spachhausen, that savings bank, is because they are so anchored into that region. And, and I'll talk about this in a second, they're part of a larger network. That savings bank knows a tremendous amount about the suppliers in that region, about the customers in that region. Um, about other businesses that are similar to that region. And so as a result, businesses, the, the value added that Spachhausen provide to businesses, the economic value, takes two forms. One, the lending, the, the terms of the loan and the loans themselves as well. And the second is information, the information that savings banks offer firms um, that they wouldn't otherwise have if they didn't have a savings bank that was so anchored to that region. The second uh, reason for why savings banks continue is organization. 
Um, these are 385 uh, independently operated savings banks, but they're part of a large network. They're part of a larger network called the Sparkassen Finanzgruppe or S Group. And that S Group consists of a network of uh, federal state banks, building societies, insurance companies, IT companies, a number of other financial service providers. <clears throat> this is a network. This is just, they're all loosely connected. Uh, the network plays a, an essential role in helping the competitiveness of these individual savings banks. Um, uh, it boosts the capacity of any individual public savings banks by enabling essentially small credit institutions to benefit from a number of economies of scale that large credit institutions have, right? So a Sparkassen is, um, uh, so for example, uh, marketing or IT or in regulatory compliance, in all those things, um, the savings bank gets to, part, gets to benefit from the enormous um, economies of scale that come from belonging to that net network. One good example is training, right? So one of the things that's really interesting is that the savings banks all share, even in, with, again, within this network, they share um, costs when it comes to training. They, they, they have the, that large network also, in addition, allows them to attract really good talent. Uh, because the savings bank network is so large, there are numerous types of jobs that are available for all kinds of, uh, of interests and, and all kinds of careers. And so that enables them to attract quality talent and the large network that they participate in allows them to spread the cost of training across a much, much larger swath of, of institutions. And as I said, the, the other area where the, uh, it really comes in, where you really see it is in IT development, the sort of the back end. You don't see the in the retail, but the back end, the lending, the loan uh, processing, the, the, again, the, the, um, all of the uh, information technology that goes behind the bank's performance is shared across this network. And so it provides the sa an individual savings bank with enormous leverage because it participate, because it's part of this larger network. And the other, the other piece of the administrative question where that comes into play is in oversight. The Sparkassen and savings banks, they're governed by multiple and overlapping oversight committees, including, as I said, the supervisory board credit committees. But one of the things that's um, unique about the Sparkassen's network is that they share in, um, they, they participate in what's called an institutional protection scheme. In other words, which is really a kind of joint liability scheme where all members of the network share liability. They share liability jointly. So they all oversee each other. They all have a incentive to make sure that the information in one institution um, can be viewed by, the, by data from another institution. Um, they, uh, in other words, they're self-regulating. The, the network regulates itself and it has an incentive to regulate itself. In some ways, it's a little bit akin to like the federal home loan bank system, which also has, uh, shares joint liability. Um, that, again, what that does is it makes oversight and accountability much, much more efficient. No individual bank has an incentive to hide, uh, you know, uh, loans that are problematic. And in fact, within the savings bank network, the, 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 over, the, the regulators within the savings bank network can easily see if there's one savings bank that suddenly is an outlier, it's easy to see and they aren't able to sort of hide uh, lending data or uh, date, loan data or, or business behavior that might be sort of an outlier or might be overly risky. So in other words, so in short, administration also plays a role. And then finally, the third part of the explanation that I, um, I believe matters is politics, right? I'm a political scientist, so I'm interested in, in politics and power. Um, Germany's savings banks exist because of their political leverage, because they're able to use their political leverage. Sparkassen remain one of the most politically powerful economic sectors in Germany. They're represented by an umbrella organization called the Deutsche Sparkassen und Giroverband, which is basically a, uh, at the federal level, but they also have 12 regional associations. Um, and, uh, and as I said, as well as 13,000 branches and 385 banks. Um, what that does is it gives Sparkassen access to people locally, right? It gives them 
enormous geographic reach. They're not just in one part of the country, they're in every single part of the country. They have, and they utilize that close connection to citizens and voters throughout the country to ensure that policies or proposals that arise that might challenge them, might transform them into something that's more, that resembles a private bank is resisted. At the same time, it also helps to ensure that policymakers at the local level and at the state level and across all political parties recognize the value of the public savings bank. So in other words, it's precisely because they're local, because they're connected to the, the local, uh, to the community, because they're anchored in the community, that they use that connection to make sure that not only do citizens, but also policymakers from every single political party is aware of the value added the Sparkassen that savings banks provide. And one of the interesting things, features of Germany's political system, some of you might be familiar with German politics, but one of the interesting things about it is that, um, you know, that um, it's, it's a system that's dominated by political parties where it's common for, for elected officials at the federal level or at the state level to have served in local office. And one of the things that's sort of interesting is just in interviews with members of parliament is how often a member of parliament or a, or a federal political leader will acknowledge that their first experience with banks has, was the savings bank, either as a customer or in some cases as a on the supervisory board. Again, what that does is it socializes, the savings banks essentially socialize both citizens as well as policymakers to the need, the value, the importance of savings banks. And then finally, um, obviously the large network that the savings bank has are used at the national level, but also at the uh, super national level. So at the European Union, uh, level, you see that savings banks use the leverage that they have from belonging to a large network to sort of press their uh, their views on on um, banking union. To one of the reasons that uh, Sparkassen have been so effective in resisting the European Union's effort at creating a European deposit insurance scheme, which really would undermine the savings bank's business model, has been because they've been able to utilize their networks and to use the essentially the influence they have with local politicians to essentially press national and supranational politicians to sort of see um, essentially their, uh, their value and their, their importance and protect them. And so, if all politics is local, Sparkassen are really um, the nation's power players. Their influence enables Sparkassen to maintain their institutional character, protect their interests, and essentially confront national reforms and the European efforts that might weaken them. So in a sense, those are my three conclusions from the research. I'm, I'm happy to talk about others. I, I also have, a, a, in a sense, a set of takeaways for um, Americans that are interested in what lessons they might offer from uh, savings banks for their own efforts at creating a, a public bank in the United States, but I'll, I'll leave that for the, for the Q&A. So I'll, I'll, I feel like I've talked too long. I, that's that's, that's uh, 30 minutes, so I'll, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> well, applause, thank you, yes. <laughs> You're very kind. Under the reaction buttons, you can uh, thumbs up or applaud or <laughs> those good reactions. Um, that was, that, that was fascinating. Um, you know, I grew up in the Netherlands, which is just next door and, and we had all kinds of smaller banks, but I don't know if they have survived. Um, so you ended with the idea and, and, and I put it also out in, in the call for other people to come and join us is the question indeed, and I'll just ask the question, what can the American banking system or uh, the citizens learn from the German system. And here I'm especially thinking, um, we, we've had discussions about postal banking to serve the underserved or the underbanked or the unbanked people that are, you know, there are many of them here in the United States. Um, and it would make sense to 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 you know have have the post offices have kind of a moderate banking role. Now I can see that if you have such a distributed uh, system that's only local, uh, as in Germany, you might not even need a postal bank, um, because as you said, and and I think that's also really fascinating that 
a part of the Sparkas is to socialize people uh, to become <laughs> good citizens. And that had had that effect on this enormous wave of immigrants that came into, your, into uh, Germany, like in 2016 and 2017. Um, that if they had access to, you know, a bank account or to other services, that 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 will solve a lot of their problems to be mobile, to be, you know, to to start the integration process into the larger um, society there. So well, I, back I, to you know, what can the U.S. learn from from this system? Well, let me let me point out two things since you raised it. I want to say it wasn't just that the Spock hasn't solved the problems of the refugees. The Spock hasn't also solved the problems of the local governments. The local governments were terrified. The local governments in Germany don't have cashiers. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, cashier box where they can just dole out money. They don't, they don't have that. In Germany, all, all of these social programs are done through bank transfers. That's how they're done. And so they, it was important in, in a sense, addressing the problems, not just for the refugees, but also of, um, of the of the uh, of the sit of the citizens of the, of the governments, excuse me, of the local governments. One other really interesting example, where you see the public mission uh, play a role, is in the recent COVID crisis. Germany had a similar program to the United States uh, in terms of helping businesses. They had a, a, a kind of a, a similar PPP system, a paycheck protection program, like the United States did, um, and it actually they actually started them around the same time. But there were big differences in how they were deployed. And the main one was, at least in the United States, when the first tranche of PPP money was let, um, it went overwhelmingly to large companies and was, and was done by large banks. Both, I should say, as a caveat, in both cases, uh, the countries relied on banks to deploy that money. So you needed to go to a bank to apply for PPP money. And, in, um, and of course, in Germany, uh, the, bigger, the biggest players were the savings banks because they had the strongest relationship to their firms. And so as a result, much of, most of that money went to sm very small enterprises. In the US, it was the exact opposite experience. In the, when that first tranche went out before, before the second tranche, almost all that money went to large companies. Um, smaller companies really struggled to get that money. And in part, it was because uh, you didn't have that kind of a saving, you didn't have that kind of public savings bank whose interest it wasn't. And again, it isn't just I don't want to sound super altruistic. These aren't development banks, right? These are banks that are there to make money, but they have this public mission and they recognize that by helping their local companies secure loans that will enable them to survive the COVID crisis, that they too will also survive and they will also thrive. And they, when we get out of COVID, they'll be better for it. And so just to give you one other example of the way that public mission really played a role in recent, really in the last year. Oh, but you asked what are the what are the lessons? Should I talk about that or not? No, no, go ahead because this 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 is something about you know what can we learn uh, here oh, in yeah, the United sorry. States because there are people here that would be opposed to public banking and there might be people that will be in favor of it. It all depends on um, you know a weighing of the advantages and the disadvantages. Right. I'll, I think there's a couple takeaways. Um, my book um, lists 10 of them. I probably will list them all, but if you're interested, they're in the book. Um, I would say one thing is that that sort of is, is important to sort of recognize is that not all public banks are the same, right? There are lots of different kinds of public banks and, this, and, the, and Germany's public savings banks are one kind. Um, you know, uh, critics of public banks, they often talk about them as if they were sort of monolithic. Well, they're, they're not at all. There are lots of different versions. The Bank of North Dakota looks very different than the savings banks in, uh, in Germany and even the, the larger state banks in Germany. Um, you know, Sparkassen are an example of sort of local retail oriented public banks in which local governments serve as trustees, uh, though not necessarily as owners of the institution. Um, the, you know, there are development banks that exist. They also exist, there are development banks that exist in Germany, which really are arms of the state. They're really entities that are, they're development banks. They're banks that are really used by government to pursue certain purposes, whether it be infrastructure projects or some sort of social purpose. But those are very, they are very political. They are, they are not, there's no management board. They are really designed to develop a certain project or certain kinds of projects. Um, and, you know, as I said, uh, I think the Spachhausen sort of are one, but again, it's important to recognize that public banks 
are really an umbrella that consists of a lot of different models. The second I would take away is that profits and public goals are not incompatible. You can do both. Um, you can be a for-profit institution that has a public purpose that, that is measured not just by profits, but by a variety of other public, uh, public goods. Um, so Sparkassen are for-profit, but they're not profit maximizing. That's not their mission. Um, their, again, their mission uh, enhances the bank's bottom line in a number of ways. That gives uh, their mission gives banks the flexibility to extend credit on terms that allow uh, firms and individuals to adopt to a long-term time horizon. Um, the public purpose enables savings banks to play a very proactive role in promoting the the region's uh, economic well-being. It's measured on those matrix uh, uh, metrics as well as. Uh, what its current uh, capital is or what its rate of return on equity is, which, by the way, save, savings, public savings banks return on equity is very, very high, higher than most other banks in Germany. Um, and again, related to that, performance ought to be measured on mission, not just profits. So comparing public and private, comparing public with commercial banks based on profits or share values really fails to take into account um, a public bank's uh, mission. Banks, uh, public banks are again, are not profit maximizing institutions. And the value added that Spakasen provide really includes, as I said, stable access to long-term credit by everyone uh, at competitive rates, right? So, um, you know, uh, there are lots of ways in which one should be measuring savings banks or public banks and uh, profits uh, may in fact be somewhat distorting in that way. Um, the one last thing I would mention, I've got a few others, but I'll pause here, is that public banks enhance competition. I want to just make the pitch for saying, because I know there are efforts around the country in the United States, in nearly every state, to create some sort of public bank. Um, in most cases, I oftentimes hear that, we're, that the legislation essentially carves out a customer base that isn't served by any other bank. And I think that's a problem, frankly. I mean, I think it's a start, and I think maybe that's what's required to get public banks passed. But I think that public banks should be there to compete with all banks. It should be able to compete with private commercial banks. They should be able to compete for customers with cooperatives or credit unions. They should be able to compete with cust for customers with community banks. I mean, they should they they enhance the customer base in a community, and I think in that sense they um, that's a good thing. And I think again, just getting back to your example of. Um, Postal banks, I think postal banks would be a great uh, uh, addition to, to local banking markets um, for the reasons that I've mentioned. It offers customers a, a greater competition. Postal banking has the benefit of a large network and a, of which it can draw on that provides all kinds of economies of scale. People are familiar with postal banking. Postal banking is actually one of, also one of those things that is liked by pretty much everyone, not postal banking, but the post office. So um, we all know, I mean, or I think most of us are familiar with the, the history that a lot of commercial banks and, and even um, uh, and community banks have the, the sort of the dubious history that some of the, them have had with, uh, with um, uh, minority groups and, and the poor in this country. But the post office is largely, um, has, a, has a generally a very good reputation. And so I think, in, in, as I said, in a lot of ways, the postal, postal banking has a lot of advantages that the, that the savings banks offer and even advantages that the savings banks don't offer. Thank you, yeah. No, I wish to go into, let's say, you know, the uh, legislative groundwork to be done uh, here in the United States to make this possible. Um, I'll just go and get some questions in. And according to Virginia, we start with Pamela Haynes to start uh, the question and answer here. Pamela, go ahead. Hey, oh, thank you very much. This was, I, I'm very appreciative of this. My question is simply, where do the profits go? Who gets them? Yeah, that's a great question. So a giant part, so there's two ways to answer that. One, a giant part of the, um, uh, uh, profits of the savings banks um, go back into the community and they do it through um, grants. And what's really funny, this is a really funny thing about savings banks. They, and again, I don't know if, if there's some Ger Germans on this call who can attest to this, but what's really funny is that, you know, Germany has a ton of clubs, 
Germany is the land of associations. You've got soccer clubs and choir clubs and all kinds of things. And, and almost all of them are funded by savings banks. Savings banks, um, they, they, tr they um, channel a tremendous amount of uh, their profits there into the community through these grants. And what's interesting about it is that it's obviously part of their mission. That's, you know, that's part of their, their mission is to enhance the local, uh, the regional economy and, the, and, and but it, what it also does is it also further solidifies the savings bank's relationship to the community, right? So they're not telling anybody that, that um, you know, you have to believe, you know, that savings banks are, are important. They're just showing it because at, at every soccer game and at every, uh, uh, you know, um, fest, you can see at the bottom of, of uh, amongst the sponsors are almost always savings banks. So a big part of their uh, profits go to that. Another big part really goes into, into their capital reserves. So they, they basically boost their reserves so that they can do more lending. Um, you know, um, their, uh, their other, uh, you know, other revenues would go into, you know, they pay taxes, they pay, I mean, they, um, uh, they grow, uh, you know, that's lending, I would say, is what they do, lending and um, kicking money into the local community through grants and charity work, um, again, which has this other added feature. In some, some, I should say, in some cities, and this is, comes up in the book, um, a lot of cities require that the savings banks, um, pay into those cities a chunk of their profits. So um, uh, it's called Ausschüttung, which are essentially provide paying dividends to the cities. And in some cities, they pay dividends and in other cities, they don't. And one of the sort of the interesting case studies in this book is really why. Why, why is it that savings banks don't pay dividends in every city? Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, um, and frankly, some managers and savings banks feel it's their obligation to pay dividends. Um, but other managers will say, no, we need that money. We need that money for reserves. Um, and again, I think it speaks to the power and the leverage that savings banks are able to exercise that they've been pretty effective in limiting the, the amount of dividends. They, the savings banks like to control their money. They like to make sure that, they're, that when they spend money in the community, that they have control over it. They don't like it just going into, into the... Um, uh, into the, the sort of the local, uh, the broader general budget, but some, but a number of them do. That's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. Now, interesting. That that makes it uh, to to use the German term. Well, it makes it almost gemütlich. Uh, how business yeah. is is then done? I mean, you know, there will be a hard side of business, but 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 it doesn't seem to be as harsh as it, uh, you know, uh, what the American cultural um, and and attitude would be. Right. Um, but anyway, let's go on with uh, <laughs> Paul. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Uh, hi there, Mark. Thank you so much. This has been a great educational experience, oh, and most of all, you. thank you for Ben. So that's been so far your greatest contribution. <laughs> um, so this is all new to me. So I'm just trying to understand. In fact, um, Pamela's question was my first question. Mm -hmm. um, to, can people own stock? Can they own shares in the bank? No, they can't own. These are public. They're under institutions under public law. They're like, again, they're kind of akin to uh, your fire department. I mean, they, 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 they really have that kind of, identity. Um, they can't own shares. The, um, again, a lot of the stakeholders, um, what's it, so what's interesting actually to can you to sort of continue on the, on the answer to the last question, what's interesting is that, so I did this research for about three years and I ended it in like 20, the end of 20. So I did my, ended my field work at the end of like 20, 2019. Um, and you know, and I, I mean, for me, the biggest question is why, why, why aren't you paying more? You're making so much money. Why aren't you paying more money to cities? And the answer was always, we need this money for the reserves. This helps us. We need this cushion. Uh, of course, 
I also think that the reason they didn't want to provide dividends was that they were worried that once they start providing dividends that that members of government will always they'll just expect it regardless of the performance of the savings banks. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons. You know, I mean, these are not progressive institutions in our in our view, right? These are these are often they're the the managers of savings banks run the gamut politically. And um, anyway, the point is that that was two years ago. The savings banks are pretty dang happy that they didn't pay everything out in dividends because when the COVID hit, they were rocked. Right? They like all financial institutions were rocked, and um, the the reserve cushion that they built up as a result of not paying necessarily as many dividends as policymakers would prefer, um, I think helps has helped them overcome uh, the economic challenges of of, of COVID. Um, but it's a it's but no, you can't. There's no shareholders. There's no there are no stocks. Um, um, they're institute. They're again. They're like police departments, sheriff departments um, uh, that are again overseen by by local government officials. Um, and some of the local officials would, as I say, would like to see the savings banks pay more. But um, a lot of them also recognize. And I did interviews with a number of them, and I always ask them, like I always ask individuals, like. Why do you bank at the savings with the Shpakas? And, and then local officials, like, I always ask, well, why don't you require them to pay dividends? And, you know, in both cases, you know, they, they, the, the customers were always like, well, you know, I, I trust the savings banks, or, or, or they give us some answer like that. And then the public officials will always often just say, you know, um, that we get, but we do benefit from the savings banks. Um, we, we benefit in other ways besides just dividends, and we benefit from having a strong savings bank in our region. And they can look at other areas um, as evidence for why that is the case. I mean, they, so, they have contrasts. So, um, you know, one of the fundamentals of monetary reform, anyway, is to separate credit creation from deposits. And it, it's seen, so how does, uh, how is credit created? by these banks? What limits the amount of credit they can create? And are the depositors at risk? Theoretically, right. anyway. All right, so they do, they do banking like uh, banking is in the United States. They have reserves and they, and they do lending based on, that, on the reserve ratio. So um, uh, that's kind of how they do it. They have to keep a certain amount of reserve, which is sort of the cushion that, they, that ensures that there won't be a, a kind of run on the institution. At the same time, they don't have deposit insurance. They insure themselves. Uh, so all the uh, participants in the, in the savings bank group, all the S group uh, participants. So that means not only the 385 other savings banks, but also the larger public uh, savings banks, the larger state public banks, as well as a number of other uh, entities. They're all self-insured. They all uh, are shared joint liability. And, and every savings bank is, is subject to the same regulatory rules as every other bank in Germany, uh, including the biggest bank. So there's no carve out for the, their size. They have to adhere to all the same rules. At the same time, within the savings bank network, there is an elaborate system of controls. They oversee each other. They really monitor each other. They audit each other. So this is actually one of the things that's really interesting about savings banks. Savings banks, like banks in the United States, they have to be audited. Uh, they're audited every year. They're audited a number of times, but they're, they have to have an auditor every year. In the US, most firms, well, companies, corporations in the United States, as well as in Germany, basically hire their auditor. They hire their, their auditor. They hire uh, you know, Ernst and Young, or they, or they, or they hire some other private entity, and you know that's a kind of a problematic relationship, right? I mean, we know that. Sure, the uh, the the accounting firm that does the audit wants to make sure that they do a good job, but they also know that the company that is hiring to do the, them to do the audit is the company that's paying them, right? So there's a there's not there's a definitely a, a and in the and in the savings bank model. It's other. It's the network that has to, that audits every savings bank, and so and they know in advance, and they can't just uh, buy a different auditor. So um, the regional associations of which savings banks are a part audit each savings banks every year, and again, 
because they share joint liability, there's a huge incentive to make sure that no individual savings bank becomes an outlier. If, if there was a savings bank that suddenly was taking his money and investing it in some crazy ass scheme in, in Cyprus, the, um, the, the regional association would know about it instantly. Um, it couldn't, at the end of the day, it couldn't prevent that bank from doing it. Banks are independent, they can do whatever they want, but they can exert extraordinary amounts of pressure to make sure that that institution behaves back on the straight and line. Um, but the more important thing is that because of that network, there is an incentive to share information, right? They know that that information is going to be used. Um, and so uh, the, um, there is, again, in this, in our country, banks have an incentive to basically keep bad information private because they worry it might affect their share value. In the German, in the savings bank system, the institute, the the the, um, the shareholders, excuse me, the deposit holders are protected by a, a joint system of liability that really does, a, in my mind, a much more efficient job of ensuring the um, the behavior of those of those financial institutions and keeping them safe. Very interesting. One final thing, uh, since there aren't many questions being asked. Um, uh, you know, no, there will be more questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> in 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 the monetary reform model. The, the, the thought is that, again, savings and deposits should be separate from credit creation, and the credit creation part should be at risk, that uh, depositors should know that their money is being invested, and uh, they're willing to lose it, and also willing to gain, you know, from the, the interest that they would get. Is, is, that, is it possible to convert this system to that model, do you see, or would that just cause it to, to disintegrate? Oh. So again, deposit. So one of the things that's interesting about the German model is it's not deposits that are insured; it's the institution. Yeah. So the the network insures the institution. Institutions never go bankrupt. They if if they if they do struggle or if, whatever their customer base, they might lose branches. Other other public savings banks will take them over, and they'll become part of a large. So you might it used to used to have, we used to have more. There used to be more public savings banks. Now they're three hundred eighty five. I mean, there used to be five hundred, six hundred, yeah. and partly because of a variety of things. I mean, not not. I mean, not because necessarily people are moving away, but people's banking behavior has changed. And what's happened is that. So you might have a, a public savings bank say, you know, I. Um, so you know, I, I've lived in um, Cleveland for a long time. So you might have had a, a public savings bank in, uh, say, Akron, and one in Youngstown, and one in Cleveland, and and uh, you know, uh, maybe one in I don't know some some suburb of, of Cleveland. And you know, over time, what happens is is that the that the savings banks might consolidate into three savings banks covering a much bigger areas. And so, at the end of the day, it's not depositors that are being insured; it's the savings bank. So the institution never goes under. It's a public institution. It's like, again, it's not. It's like your 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 fire department. You know, you it it you can't go. Your fire department can't go bankrupt. I mean, it can go into debt. And it can go into, but it's not, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's taken over by some other public entity. And, and that's the model of the of the savings banks. I mean, there are, as again, there the within the savings bank network, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of paint that there aren't funds. I mean, there are clearly each bank and each region contributes to a, a whole series of funds that are used to sort of offset if there are losses, they'll be used, but it's all in-house, it's all within the system. And um, that system ensures institutions, not depositors. Very good, thank you. Great. Uh, next on my list is your student, Ben, ben. go ahead. Uh-oh, now it gets rough. Well, <laughs> nothing rough here, Dr. Cassell. I, this is the second time I've heard you talk about Sparkerson. And I think the question that hasn't really rung, run on my mind until now, is uh, what what are the what, what do you think is the biggest disadvantage of Sparkerson's model? You know, I feel like most mostly you're just singing Sparkerson's praise. Maybe that Sparkerson deserves many many praises, but I'm just curious, what do you think is the, are the biggest problems that Sparkerson face, and what do you think if there if, if anything is a problem in the model of a of a Sparkerson as a model of banking? So that's um, really it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there are different challenges that Spock hasn't faced. I mean, or, 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 or problems, I guess, is maybe not the right word. But 
I mean, clearly savings banks um, that have a very boring, boring business model um, are very vulnerable to low, low interest rates. I mean, low interest rates are, excuse me, hurting savings banks because their primary business model is based not on commissions, but is based on, um, on net interest rate. In other words, the difference between the interest they pay to depositors and the interest they take in from lenders. And so when interest rates really plummet, it, it makes them it makes it difficult for them. There's no question. I think um, at least for savings banks, their, their um, comparative advantage really relies on that institutional protection scheme. It relies on being able to have joint share joint liability. I think there are lots of efforts at the European at the level of the European Union, in part driven by the good intentions mostly of the French, who would like to see, Europe divided into a whole, a relatively small set of very, very large banks, um, preferably private banks that are easier to regulate and creating a one large, uh, you know, a small set of very large financial institutions that are easy to oversee, easy to regulate and have a system of deposit insurance akin to the FDIC. That would decimate savings banks in Germany, I think, because it would take away their primary um, uh, uh, comparative advantage. I, you know, I think there are other challenges. I mean, I think, I frankly think savings banks should pay more dividends to local governments. I mean, um, I think that they're expensive. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, one of the funny things of me is that, you know, they're, they, 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 I mean, it's, I don't know if it's a problem for them or a problem in the model, but they tend to be pretty pricey in terms of retail banking. At the same time there, I would say, you know, again, I have to harp on their and the good things about them, but Spakhausen are incredibly efficient. They, their administrative costs are a fraction of what um, uh, the administrative costs are of private banks as well as cooperatives. And part of the reason that their administrative costs are so low <clears throat> is, you know, that they're not, I mean, the people that work there are, are not, are, they're not private actors. I mean, they're not, pri they're not demanding the same salaries that uh, you know, a Chase or a Deutsche Bank or, I mean, they, they're, 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 the managers at savings banks do really well. They have a good salary, but you know, basically they're, 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 they're kind of public servants in a way. They definitely, ha there's definitely that, that sensibility. And the other thing about public savings banks is that once people enter into the public savings bank, public savings banks, they employ about 210,000 people. Um, so a young person like yourself it's very common for a young person to enter the savings bank system through as an intern. Um, in fact, they take in thousands of, of interns every year. And that intern goes through a very uh, robust uh, training system. And what oftentimes happens is that um, once they enter into that system, they tend not to leave because they can easily not only go to different banks, but they can also go to uh, different different sectors of the bank. So if, whether it's IT or marketing or loan sales or or whatever. And so it gives, and so basically they, that, that again, um, getting back to the previous question, why is it that they are so good at overseeing their behavior? I think another reason is that there's a tremendous amount of socialization within the savings bank network. So that, and, and that socialization sort of indoctrinates um, employees to sort of, making sure that they behave in a very sound manner and they don't stray. And again, once people are in that system, they, they tend to stay. I was struck by how many upper managers I met that had started their careers in, um, in the savings banks. And that is really different because I've also done research on private banks. And in private banks, I don't know if some of you are, have worked in private banks or have friends who work, but it's very, it's, that's the, that's, it's the opposite. In private banks, it's very common. In fact, it's encouraged to jump, to, to move from one institution to another institution to another institution, to really not really have any particular loyalty to any one institution is, is, the, is the pathway moving forward. And that's a very different model from the savings bank model. Thank you, Mark. Just one follow-up question from what all you said. It makes a lot of sense, then thank you. Look, why, why, why is it encouraged at American private banks for um, employee like, like workers to, to jump between institutions? What do you think is the reason for that? I think I actually think I mean I think the reason for it um, is you know there's a variety of one I'm sure others can talk about this but I think just in general in the United States we 
we don't do a very good job of investing in training. And that has to do with a kind of almost a, a, um, a, a prisoner's dilemma problem. If one institution, if a, if a firm, regardless of whether it, what it is, whether it's a bank or a manufacturing firm or a retail outlet, if they spend a lot of money on training you, Ben, um, what's the first thing that their competitor is going to do? They're going to offer you a dollar more an hour and they're going to hire you. So I, as the, as the source, as the training, have spent all this money to train you, to get you to the point that you're going to add value to my company. And the first thing that happens is the next company just offers you a dollar more. They don't end up having to pay any money for the training and they get you. It's, a, it's, it's easy. So, I mean, I think certainly one reason has to do with the, the way in which companies are organized in, in, just generally in the United States, that they, they really, there's no easy mechanism. There's no, like in Germany, for example, there's a strong um, tradition of having business associations that businesses have to belong to. And certainly the Spachhausen network is one example, but it also applies to other uh, industries as well where, where firms are part of a network. And oftentimes what that means is um, that that obligates those members to, to do certain things. Um, which overcome some of those collective action problems. And among them is has to do with training, um, investment in R&D and other things. But I would say at least partially, that's one reason. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Ben, you started your internship with uh, a, a little startup organization here instead of a Sparkasse. Um, although on the very, other side, I don't know. Very how... lucky. <laughs> Because I don't know what the downside might be to be socialized into a German bank. Um, <laughs> that can be a whole other uh, uh, story. Uh, but anyway, um, we have John next. And then I have to say Carly is next. And I saw, I think, John Conroy waving his hand. So we'll start with John. John, go ahead. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Dr. Castle. This has been really informative. and. Uh, I want to uh, I want to ask a question, and uh, as, as you know, uh, undoubtedly know, um, uh, there have been three different models of banking uh, that have been described by economists over time, uh, and uh, uh, these have uh, uh, been a source of some controversy. But uh, important work has been done recently by Richard Werner um, to. Uh, uh, do an experiment and he uh, to determine empirically uh, how uh, how banks really operate and which one of these models uh, actually um, fits the data and uh, he did his study in a small German bank a Raffaisen bank uh, okay. and this is apparently a cooperative bank and I'm interested in hearing you know uh, uh, the, the differences in these banks but what I'm interested in is your emphasis on the fact that all the, the public banks, uh, the, the savings bank, the Sparkassen, uh, uh, essentially operate by the same rules as every other bank in Germany. And so this is basically the model of banking that is global in which uh, essentially money is created as banks uh, extend credit. So this is a credit creation of uh, model of, of, of money. Um, so uh, what, I, what my question is, is, is that uh, it seems clear from what you said that in fact, uh, the, uh, the Sparkassen operate in the, exactly the same way in terms of the same accounting systems uh, in, in, in terms of, of their, their, their creation of money as credit is, is the same as all the other banks. And it's not a different model, namely the model of, of, uh, of uh, intermediation uh, uh, that uh, was shown to be an inadequate model to uh, to describe banking. Uh, so I, I guess uh, what I what uh, what I want to know is is are all these different banks, the cooperative banks like this Raffaisen Bank, where 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 Richard Werner did his study, uh, do they in fact operate in exactly the same way in terms of their accounting system and the way they create money as they make loans? So that's a great question. And um, so Raiffeisen banks or, or cooperatives, um, you know, uh, have a rich tradition in Germany. They're, they're, as, as banks go, there are more of those uh, cooperative banks uh, or credit unions than there are actual savings banks. They tend to be a lot smaller though. They tend to be smaller and there's more of them. I would also recommend just as, a, as an aside, 
one of my favorite books um, is by a woman named Susan Hoffman. And uh, she wrote a book called The Politics of Banking. Um, and she's at Western Michigan. And she does an amazing historic exploration comparing credit unions with savings and loans and commercial banks and really looking at their origins and their philosophical origins and argues that each of them really comes from a very different place, right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, credit unions, I mean, their, their purpose was really, and it's, it isn't the case in Germany, is to, to basically provide financial support and education to, its, to their members, uh, to their participants, right? And, and that was taken very seriously by Raiffeisen, but it's also the case in the United States. The history of credit unions is really not just the history of providing capital and liquidity, it's also providing um, financial education to the members of those institutions. At the same time, savings and loans, and, and really, and has a, and excuse me, and the, and the credit unions have a very strong democratic um, pulse to them, right? They have a very strong democratic base. Savings and loans come from a very different place, right? They were the creation of really progressives, um, uh, uh, without sort of getting into too many of the weeds, but, but basically progressives who's, who design the system, not from below, but really from above to create the architecture that whose primary purpose was to funnel capital into housing, right? Savings and loans were only about, or primarily about providing housing. And, uh, you know, the origins of, of, uh, of um, the savings and loan system the, uh, uh, the, at the beginning of the 20th century really the, the, the creation of experts um, who've designed the system. And of course, uh, commercial banks are really about providing um, support for, uh, for businesses. And in Germany, the, the credit unions were primary, were their history of credit unions, again, those are not public entities, they're, they're private entities, they're owned by their members. Um, they also have a similar regional uh, principle. So they adhere to the a, a lot, some of the same regional principles. They tend historically to be located in more rural areas, so that's changed somewhat. Um, you know, but their history is really one of serving uh, more rural areas. Whereas savings banks, as I mentioned earlier, come out of industrialization and the industrial revolution, and they are and their history is very much tied to the industrial workers and industri and and the poor in cities. Um, but at the end of the day. Credit unions are there to essentially support their members. They they have the you know the added advantage that they provide some public goods to the region, but that's not their primary mission. I mean, their primary mission is is really about serving their members, and and they do that I think pretty well. Um, but again, they tend to be as a result very very small, the um, much 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 smaller than any of the savings banks. Well, my question though is. Mm -hmm. Is each of these banks do they operate in exactly the same way in, in terms, terms of their credit creation? Yes. Yeah, the credit creation. Yeah, right. Sorry. Well, one of the, one of the things that it's so impressive about your story is the importance of local, of doing things locally and having some kind of local uh, 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 loyalty um, in in a community, uh, and and that we've sort of lost that in this country, particularly over a whole host of things, not just banking, uh, but many other things as well. And it strikes me that uh, for, the, for the public banking movement in, in this country, uh, uh, that, that it would require a kind of a cooperative arrangement among the banks like you have described uh, for the, the Sparkassen, uh, that this larger organization of which they are a part gives it, it its solidity in a sense and, and its uh, um, the security that, 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 that its customers can have in it. And so it seems to me that that might be a message for public banking in this country, that somehow that kind of an organization uh, uh, of, of distributed liability, as you described it, uh, might be important. So I'll just, I'll just close because I think there are other questions, but I'll just say um, that it isn't just that it's gone away in the United States, it's gone away in Europe. Most European countries had local public savings banks, right? And the reason that they don't have them isn't because of sort of the natural law of economics. It's all about politics, right? It's all about, I mean, larger banks always argue. <laughs> they always want to buy, buy out. They always want to get rid of the advantage. I mean, savings banks are really competitive. I mean, they, um, and across Europe, really, in England, you saw that in Italy, you've seen it in Spain, larger institutions, 
exercise their political muscle to change the laws, to change the rules that really undermine that local connection. And what's surprising to me is that um, savings banks in Germany have exercised the political muscle and the leverage to keep it. They aren't passive. They are not passive players that just has the world done to them. They're conscious, they're aware of how policies affect them. And um, so that local connection, yeah, it's real, but it just doesn't happen by accident. And it's not just the result of an efficient market hypothesis. Many thanks. Sure. Um, I have Carly next. Carly, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my question, you had made a comment um, earlier on about uh, banks not having a good reputation with minority groups. And so I was wondering if, um, I don't know if you could speak on like how the public savings banks, um, you know, I, I hear that they're very community driven, but do you see them taking initiatives to like build that relationship with minority groups? Um, yeah. So, I mean, what I was referring to was really like a history of redlining, the history of uh, discriminatory mortgage practices, the history of um, all kinds of uh, sort of nefarious efforts on the part of financial institutions. And today, you know, I mean, you sort of see with payday lending and um, all kinds of, which are often not just, you know, are oftentimes subsidiaries of larger institutions that we think of as being sort of mainstream banking that are really sucking equity and um, wealth out of communities rather than providing support. So that was, the, that was where that comment comes from. <laughs> that is not coming from my research. I was focused on public banks in Germany, <laughs> but I'm interested in just generally in um, banking in the United States. And, and so one of the reasons I think that public, uh, Post office, postal banking at least has a, has, a, um, has a chance of succeeding is in part because of its reputation across all sectors of a US society. Uh, the post office is one of the most popular public institutions, bar none in the country um, across all sorts of sectors. So that's where that comes from. But basically, to, to, but to address your point, your question about public savings banks, I don't wanna sugarcoat it. Public banking in Germany and public savings banks are not panaceas. There are lots of racists that exist in those public banks too. I mean, I'm not gonna, I mean, it's not like they're all, I mean, they're, they're, they, but there are rules, there are structures in place that help to channel, to reduce the influence of that, that, that. And I think one of them is, I think, as I said, the public mission. And I think you saw that in play when it came to the refugee crisis. I'm not saying that every public uh, I wouldn't say that every savings bank manager was delighted in the fact that they now had to offer um, accounts to uh, refugees coming, but they had to. And I think at the end of the day, um, it's rules and structures that matter. Personality, it's nice to have people that aren't racist and um, have uh, you know, a more enlightened sense of what they should be doing. But at the end of the day, I think it's, I think it, um, I think it's structures, it's, it's, it's rules, it's, it's the architecture of the financial system. That, um, that helps uh, mitigate um, some of the problems that I've described. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think that, it, I do think that the incentives that savings banks have that are linked to the regional prosperity um, help to ensure that some of the things, some of the, some of the um, discriminatory lending practices are, are mitigated. I think that that makes a big difference. The fact that a savings bank can't just go and leave or go to some other place or pick and choose, I think makes a big difference. Um, uh, and, um, and as I said, they, I would also argue that, again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna I'm not pan, painting a panacea of savings banks. I mean, they're not, they're not, they don't solve all problems and they don't have, and they're not free of problems. But um, I do think that there are structures within the savings bank network and within savings banks themselves, which include the supervisory board that includes local government officials, that in helps to ensure that the savings bank behaves in a, in a, uh, in a way that is consistent with um, democratic values and dis uh, non-discriminatory values. So um, that's, yeah, so that's my, that's my take on that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, my, my, my question was really, 
why are they even existing? I, I, I would, I think it would be interesting to look at that question actually. You know, how, I mean, Germany has lots and lots of um, minority groups, lots of Turks, lots of Syrians, lots of Afghanis, um, lots of Eastern Europeans. It would be interesting, frankly, to look at, you know, how the different banking institutions address those different groups. My suspicion is that savings banks do pretty well, but um, I don't know for sure. Thank you, that was a very helpful answer. Great. Uh, John Conroy, next. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I had heard that um, the EU was passing uh, regulations for banks that were making it difficult for the SPARCAS. And, uh, and you mentioned briefly that France had an idea for a different model that included FDIC-like insurance, and, and that would be something for the entire Eurozone. Uh, is the SPARCAS under... Um, you know, are they having problems trying to uh, exist in this framework and are they threatened? Yes and yes. <laughs> yes, they are, <laughs> yes, they're having a hard time existing in that framework and they are threatened. You know, I mean, France itself the, um, has, is dominated by a small number of very, very large institutions. I mean, the, the average size of, of banks in, in France is much, much, much larger than in Germany. Um, have I frozen or are you... John, are you from? Okay, you seem to be in and out. So I, I don't know if you're able to yeah, see. Yeah, I'm somewhat frozen. Um, but to basically to answer your question. I can hear. Okay. Uh, to answer your question, um, uh, yes, uh, German public savings banks are threatened by, by efforts to create a banking union that treats all institutions the same in Europe and sets up a European deposit insurance corporation. A couple of years ago, after the financial crisis, Europe adopted um, a, um, a, a common resolution scheme um, and a, um, uh, a common regulatory scheme. So they adopted a European-wide regula regulation uh, system of regulation and a European-wide uh, system of, uh, of resolution, a kind of a conservatorship program that applied across all of Europe. Um, but the savings banks managed to ensure, I, I would argue, Germany as well as the savings banks put in place, a, they stipulated that those European wide set of rules apply to institutions of a certain size. So they primarily apply to larger institutions. Now, most of, like, um, but now many countries in Europe, but particularly France, would like to sort of get rid of that, um, that uh, threshold and essentially apply the rules across all banks, financial institutions in Europe. Um, uh, as I said, the savings banks have resisted deposit insurance altogether. They, they don't resist the idea of having, um, uh, they, they, don't, they don't oppose the idea of having um, a certain number of reserves. In other words, requiring institutions of having a certain reserve level. Um, they or or criteria to ensure that those institutions are safe, but they resist the idea of a um, common deposit insurance scheme because, as I said, it undermines their comparative advantage, which comes from an institutional protection scheme. And so, at this point, they've still been fairly effective in in sort of fighting that effort at creating a European-wide deposit insurance scheme. Um, I will say that it's remarkable in in the book in the in the chapter six of the book. I actually um, list, um, Brussels actually has data on all the lobbying that's done in Brussels. They have a lobbying register and they tells you how much each lobby, each, how much each industry spends on lobbying, the companies that lobby and the number of employees. And if you look at that, the, 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 financial, the financial, obviously like in the United States, the financial sector is the largest bar, bar none lobbying entity in Brussels, but within that, the private commercial banks are you know, like 20 times what public savings banks are. I mean, if you looked at that, you would think that public savings banks have no chance, no prayer. But in fact, partly because of their influence on Germany and German politicians and Germany's influence within the EU, they've essentially kept a lot of those rules at bay. It's in the, it's in the book. I would recommend um, checking out the book. <laughs> Uh, we, 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 we do carry uh, a link to the Amazon uh, to get your book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I have Lucille next on the list. Lucille, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much, uh, Mark. It's fascinating, very, very, very informative. Um, my question, I think, is a bit of a follow up to John Howe's question, um, but also harps back to your comment earlier uh, in, in relation to Pamela's question in the beginning of what, what do they do with their profits? And the second thing you said is, you know, after grants was that they put a significant amount into their reserves, their, um, their capital reserves so that they can do more lending. And so that, and yet you answered, John, that they function like every other modern bank today of creating money in the process of lending it, creating it as credit. Um, and that seems a little bit, um, some disjuncture there maybe. Um, and, but my real question then is, um, even if they're, they're like, other banks um, and creating money as credit, from what you've described, it seems like that they might, that the transition to banks functioning as intermediaries with sovereign money um, that is created as a public asset, that Sparkhausen could transition pretty seamlessly to that from the descriptions that you've given of it. So my first question is, is that accurate um, uh, takeaway from what you're saying? My second question is, did you hear, did you witness any discussion, um, commentary in the Sparkhausen staff and personnel and um, oversight boards? Um, of interest in sovereign money and interest in in um, a shift and and interest in the problems in our banking system at the much higher bigger level um, so i don't know if that was clear um that that's a great question um so um since you're sitting next to somebody with with, a, with experience in germany I, i'm sure that he can also attest to this Germans, when it comes to money, are um, remarkably conservative. <laughs> I would say the the um, the appetite for doing something dramatic or doing something that would change their model is very low. I think in general, I think um, the they and I think that sort of rethinking um, the creation of money, um, I I think would be I think Spachhausen might be in some ways the least likely to do that, frankly, partly because of the socialization that I've mentioned and their emphasis on stability and, and continuity that um, is sort of built within their, their, their DNA. Um, and then I just think that Germans, you know, I mean, they're just sehr conservative. I mean, they're, especially when it comes to money. I mean, every German of a certain age when you ask them about spending, I mean, they Germans are even Germans don't want to run a deficit ever. You know, even when they're in a recession, they don't want to run a deficit. I mean, they're the the battle. The battle in Germany today is whether, in the you know, in a record pandemic, whether the federal government should 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 run a deficit. I mean, and this is a battle that's waged by. I mean, and and I think there's a just a general consensus that 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 maybe but only because we're in a we're in a giant pandemic and the rationale for that is because of you know the experience of money um you know and in hi hyperinflation and and just the 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 stories that have been told from generation to generation i mean my my i i don't know for sure it wasn't a research question that i asked but that's my that would be my gut instinct mm -hmm. is to sort of say that germans more than more than most europeans and in probably more even than Americans tend to be very wary of any kind of dramatic change when it comes to mm -hmm. their monetary system. If I just could follow up, it's your answer is so striking because everything you describe to me is fitting with mm -hmm. a sovereign money system. Yeah. And also the the 
the transition seems very seamless mm -hmm. with their business model <laughs> and their their approach. Um, and you know, in many ways, I think sovereign money is conservative. The mm -hmm. system itself is allows people to to kind of live within our means. Right. Um, but don't, don't you think that it would require a different way of thinking about banking and thinking about monetary policy? I think one that would be much closer to a spark housing model. Right. But I just think just the process of having to rethink, I don't know. I mean, again, uh, I, it's not a research question that I looked into, but my, my gut instinct is to say that Germans are very resistant to to, to change, <laughs> and that's just, I have no empirical reason, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's 100% true, but just speaking from my own relatives and the people that I know, they just tend to not want to do things differently. <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't know, maybe in Holland, man, go back, what do you think? <laughs> like, do the oh yeah, they, 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 they're, they're they're being very creative to 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 bring out the message. Uh, they I, you know they have a um, a play, a theater play. Um, translated, the title was "Taken by the Bank," and it's about all the ravages that the credit bank system uh, can cause. Um, but okay, so uh, I don't think there's anybody further anymore so I I want to I want to drill down to into some of the specifics uh, that especially Lucille and John uh, brought up so I want to be totally sure Mark that we're on the same page when we when we talk about this uh, the banking model because if Germans would be explained to how the system really works and combine that with the conservatism, they might be up for a rude awakening that's, that they will get into action to, to, to change it really radically because um, a lot of people are not aware of how the banking system actually works. Even bankers uh, 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 that have been interviewed are not necessarily knowledgeable about it. So I wanna start with, with this Richard Werner, uh, who is a German uh, and, and he's kind of a great expert also on, on uh, uh, central banking. So he went to this Raiffeisen Bank. Uh, I put it in the chat somewhere, uh, yeah. somewhere in Bavaria. He took out a loan of 200,000 uh, euros and the, the, the leadership of the bank let him follow the whole process of accounting how that, 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 that loan was processed. The Conclusion was that the bank did not put up any depositors money to create his $200,000 uh, 200, uh, uh, euro loan. It really just put it into his account and there was no intermediation. So I wanna to be totally sure because in the beginning of our uh, meeting, you said that the, the Sparkassen they take in deposits and then they loan it out. And then the business model is that they, you know, take it in for less interest than they loan it out. And the difference is then their, um, their profit or their income. That is what, what, what John was referring to as that there are three different models kind of going around how to explain banking and, and money creation. And the one that, you are referring to, we call that the intermediation. The bank is really the intermediator between depositors and uh, the borrowers. So in a very short way, you could say deposits create loans. Now what research, especially Richard Werner and others have found out and what is now being uh, admitted even by big banks uh, in Germany, in uh, the Bank of England, uh, some French banks, some Dutch banks, is that um, loans create deposits. You take out a loan and boom, it is in your deposits, almost out of nothing. And then you can go, you know, buy your house with it. So that's that's then by this, this Richard Werner called the, the, uh, the credit creation theory of banking. 
So I want to be sure uh, that we're on the same page that that how the uh, 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 the spire castle work is it really an intermediation model, or are they doing like the rest of the banks and you know especially the big banks uh, that uh, especially the Raiffeisen Bank where where Werner really proved uh, how how it works uh, that it's a, it, it's a credit creation model that is applicable. So which of the two would be the uh, the the, <laughs> the applicable theory according to you? Well, so I would say a couple of things to that question. I would say that, um, first of all, I, as I tried to explain a little bit, the, the economic value that banks, that savings banks provide the, their local government, or excuse me, their local region, is not just lending, right? They provide a lot of important information um, to firms. They provide, they are sort of, in a sense, the center of a nexus of economic activity in their community. And, that, and playing that centralized role is really important for the health of that of that community. And in a way, it's it's doing economic development, but it does it indirectly. So, um, uh, you know, I just would I would just say, you know, first off, that the, the the role of savings banks isn't captured exclusively by any by either of the two character either the two categories you've described. Um, and I think the you know in other work um, there's a book by Richard Deeg at the at Temple University where he also does a really good job of describing the the importance that savings banks play in in communities and the value added that they have that it's just independent of the lending. The second I'd say is that yeah I think that there's no question that savings banks create credit. I mean there's they um, they lend money they take in deposits. The larger, the, the greater the reserves, the more deposits, the, the more lending they do. And certainly the, the lending that is done um, goes to pay for, you know, it goes to pay the construction person or the, uh, you know, it goes to pay bills that go into other people's pockets that in turn get deposited and then in turn get made into, into, into loans. Um, and, uh, but it isn't just the uh, reserves that determine the lending levels. I mean, again, um, you know the the uh, you know the, the I would say that the network itself, the way in which the network also regulates itself, affects the the amount of lending that a, an individual bank can do. Um, it, it it because the um, you know, just it's because it's able to provide that sort of the institutional backstop to that institution. At the end of the day, as I said, the institution is insured, not the individual depositor. And I think in that calculation, um, again, your characterization of, of uh, the credit creation or the intermediary leaves something out. It doesn't seem like it captures everything that the savings banks do or how they do things. Um, I think it all, what you've described is a very simple model that I think leaves out a lot of nuance that exists within the savings bank model and the savings bank system. But at the end of the day, no, there's absolutely no question. I mean, savings banks take in reserves and they make loans based on those reserves. And those loans in turn get deposited in other institutions that in turn can make further loans. And, and I think there's no question that, um, that uh, you get uh, the creation of, of money that way. But how, how how aware do you think Germans are uh, of 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 that? Because our mm -hmm. our uh, uh, you know educational uh, um, motto or not motto but goal is to to make people aware that that uh, there is this credit creation going on and it has uh, systemic uh, devastating effects, and that if people would be open to change the banking system back again to real intermediation. That is what we are proposing. That, mm -hmm. And a lot of people are not aware of it. They already think it, it is intermediation, and, and, but it's not happening. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, there's an interesting paper about uh, how Swiss bankers talk amongst each other compared mm -hmm. to how they talk to uh, uh, the, 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 the public. And they found out that when they talk to the public, they say, yeah, 
we as banks, we, we, we are intermediaries. So they're kind of outright lying because amongst each other, they apparently know the truth of how they are um, um, proceeding. And right. I can imagine, you know, there's not only in Swiss banks, but also in German and Dutch and English and American banks, that's, that, that might be uh, uh, the case. Um, so again, my question is, look, how, how aware are, are the Germans or Europeans or, you know, anybody in the world of how the bankers really operate and how the awakening um, might affect politics? Um, and, and to get a legislation through to make a sovereign money system where banks cannot just create, you know, deposits uh, by with someone else just, you know, signing a piece of paper uh, with the promise to pay, uh, you know, the, the, the principal and the interest. Right. So, I mean, um, I'm not sure how many uh, people are, are, are conscious of how banks work. I suspect not many. Um, I do think, though, they... I think though that um, I think that the the, the the level of consciousness and the salience of our savings is pretty high in Germany. I think that most Germans save a lot. Um, they understand savings, and maybe they don't understand savings in the way that you described. In other words, maybe they don't see how savings in turn maybe leads to the creation of credit. But they certainly understand. That that the that, that they understand credit and they understand savings and they understand the importance of both credit and savings in their they believe that it's important in their economy, and I think that they again I think that for many Germans they look at history, you know I mean the, the very old people most of them are dead now but but their parents uh, you know they look back at Germany's um, financial devastation prior to the Second World War. And many, I'm not sure it's the right argument, but many would, would argue that not only did um, loose monetary policies and, and the printing of money undermine the country's economy, but it created the, the, the environment that led to the Second World War. I, I'm not somebody who subscribes. I think that the, the reasons for the Second World War are more, a lot more complicated. And I'm not gonna go there, but I'm just saying that that myth remains in the minds of, of many Germans. But the other thing that remains in the minds of the Germans is the is the economic is the is the economic um, upturn after the Second World War. That economic miracle um, that occurred after the Second World War is is in fact fresh in the minds of most Germans, uh, certainly most baby boomers who uh, who witnessed the 1950s witnessed the 1950s the 1960s as a period of tremendous economic growth. And quite honestly, the Spachhausen were, were at the center of that. Um, and the lending that was done was at the center of that. And so when you say, are they aware of it? Do they, are they, do they think that it's gonna lead to some vulnerabilities in the larger economy? I think they would say, I think most people would say, well, look, we've just lived through, set, we've lived through a period of more prosperity than, the, in the, than has ever occurred in the history of the world. That that period of Europe, and I'm speaking now for my grandparents, you know, my grandparents, they lived through two world wars and their parents lived through world wars. I mean, it was, it was understood that you would have economic upheaval and war every 25 or 30 years. And, you know, honestly, since 1945, Europe has not only not had a war, but it's seen an economic growth trend that's really historic. Uh, so I'm not saying that the Spachhausen are the reason for all of that, but they were certainly in the middle of it. And I think a lot of Germans definitely, definitely um, connect savings banks to their post-war history of economic growth. No, and I can see that that creates a, a, a great psychological uh, attachment um, to, the, to the system. Uh, nevertheless, we think that it has incredible systemic uh, risks and, and um, in, in later, um, Communications. I want you to 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 look into uh, this German organization Monitative, which is our sister organization, and the work by Joseph Huber, who was like a, a economic sociologist, uh, um, who is one of the great thinkers actually in in what we're trying to do uh, and change uh, on sovereign money. But I will not push further uh, this uh, point because I think maybe Paul or Stephen might do. 
Uh, first, Paul, then Stephen. Uh, Paul, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Mark that uh, transitioning to a um, sovereign money system for these banks would never happen. It would Their whole model would, would disintegrate. Um, it, it's, it's just a whole different um, philosophy. Um, it, I'm a little uncomfortable with it. There's something that seems that just because I'm an American and uh, there's something controlling it feels. Uh, they get to decide who, who gets the grants and uh, it's, it feels a little undemocratic. Uh, but it, but it, I would say it does have, you know, it had the supervisory boards really do are controlled by local governments, right? And so you do have a strong municipal uh, trustee component to it. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. That's real. That really is real. So yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to read your book. I hear, <laughs> but what, you're, hear what you're saying. The, the other point I would ask a little bit of an announcement. I just finished reading Ronnie Phillips' book. Um, he's a historian economist. His, his concentration was on the, the the FDR period. Um, and he's gonna be uh, at a coffee house in, on, uh, in June. Um, I was struck by the fact that back then there was no question that banks created money. It, it's kind of ironic that Werner had to kind of reinvent or rediscover something that the economists back then, it was explicit. That, that was what they were trying to stop. And uh, as far as FDIC, if, uh, deposit insurance, they wanted to end that by making money safe. That's so you wouldn't need deposit insurance. And it, it's amazing how much information and knowledge we lost since then. He, even Milton Friedman completely understood that banks created money and they wanted to separate the money creation process from the credit creation process. And uh, it was, it's, just fascinating to look back in history and see how our understanding of banking has kind of morphed. You know. yeah. Right. I, I mean, I agree. I mean, when, I, I mean, I will say one of the things that's sort of interesting about the institutional protection scheme that exists within the savings banks is that it really puts the onus on oversight on the institutions that are affected by the behavior of those banks. So, but by that, I mean that in most cases, you know, you're a customer of a bank. Bank regulation, you know, there, there's this um, moral hazard problem that we all face, right? And, and deposit insurance was supposed to solve that, which is that basically as a customer, you and I, we should be able to assess the, you know, if we put our money in a bank, we should be able to assess whether or not that bank is behaving in a way that we think is safe and sound. And we we sort of abdicate that role with deposit insurance. And deposit insurance in the end only ends up working if you have an effective government, right? You have, the, because you're essentially, now you're the individual customers is kind of contracting out, they're farming out their oversight of the institution that they themselves have an incentive because they have the deposits of overseeing. So now we're not gonna do that. We're gonna farm that out to some uh, government corporation or some private or some, some public entity, but it only works if, if that public entity is strong, has the capacity, and that the institution that's being regulated is we is willing to be regulated and willing to reveal that information mm -hmm. in the institutional protection scheme that's not the case the uh, because of that joint liability dynamic it isn't the depositors who are directly affected by the behavior of the bank it's the other members of that network and so they themselves i mean to me the principal agent problem is essentially addressed in that model because the entities that are charged with overseeing, the internal entities that are charged with overseeing the behavior of that bank, are they also the ones who would be harmed directly if that bank behaved in a way that was unsound? And so um, I think it's it's a very different, and in fact, it used to be the case, you know, they used to have, um, I forget when it was in the, it was in the late 19th century in the United States, the banks around in, in agricultural areas in Illinois and in Indiana and other places, they used to have that kind of a, of a joint liability system. And the idea was basically it had to do with weather, right? So if you spread the risk across a number of institutions, then if you had a weather issue in one area, it could not, it, the other areas would essentially have the ability to, to sort of make up for the, for the, or to cover some of the losses of that one institution. And so they, there would be an incentive if everybody sort of bought into it and they would be self-regulating in terms of how they do that. So we, we have a history of doing that. 
And deposit insurance sort of very much veers in the, in the opposite. Char Charles right. Calaramas's work on deposit, the history of deposit insurance sort of gets at that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, folks, we're, we're getting close to uh, nine o'clock. So um, I'll let Stephen Walsh have a short question and then I'll have Mr. Dr. Castle a short answer to that, after which I want to, you know, say what, what the next uh, coffee house is. I'm very sorry, John Howell. <laughs> we'll keep it to Steve. Stephen, short question. You're, you're... You're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry, I unmuted. Um, well, one, from one person listening, a, a huge thank you, Mark. You have a, a fantastic personality and, a, and, a, and, and uh, it's been super informative. And as far as us um, tough monetary reformers go, you really shine a light on uh, Spockhausen and, and public banking, how it, it might well exist and should exist. And I don't think we as monetary, getting into Hovert and Huber and the monetary uh, uh, reform movement at large, um, I think the Spockhausen, like a good, um, True or um, bullfighter sidesteps our charge by by putting them into the public arena and uh, and you've given that a, a splendid performance like a bullfighter you you can you can twirl the cape and we just went past you oh, but no. I but what but just to get to the heart of the matter though is we're very concerned with the concept of shared seniorage. And we're very concerned is how do we take care of the GDP gap? And, um, and, and then I, I won't go into that because of time, but I'm gonna just mention lastly, uh, Mona Tief and uh, a wonderful German friend I have, uh, Klaus, who's the head of it there, uh, friend of Huber, of course. And Klaus would say, and, and sort of uh, agreeing with you, of course, he's, his statement, because he wants to change, but he's, he's German and, he, and he's trying to change the German system. It's mission impossible to start with. <laughs> and what he points out to us or to me is safety. You know, the Germans have gone through hell during the, the, the 20th century and they want security. They, you know, the word reform is repugnant. You know, they can't handle the word reform. However, and this is his slice on getting them to think more, is safety. <laughs> he emphasizes safety in a monetary system so we can think safely going into the future. And that's sort of the, uh, uh, um, his elevator approach to thinking about people and getting people involved. And I just wanna say um, in the end, I think we all have good hearts and we're, we're, uh, we want a better life for all humans and thank you very much. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Stephen. Indeed. Um, so, Dr. Castle, I, I'd like to invite you for next month's uh, coffee house, uh, which will be on central bank uh, <laughs> money, and it will be um, done by none less than Benjamin Leninger. Um, so, this will be May twenty fourth. Same time on a Monday again, uh, 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Central Bank Digital Currency, friend or foe. And he will uh, let us know how he has learned to think with us and with you, Dr. Castle. And um, we'll have another two hours of chewing on, <laughs> chewing on money. Um, it was news for me that we'll have Joe Polito then in June. Uh, is there a specific date already set for that, Paul, that we can share here? You mean Ronnie Phillips, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a date. Um, darn it. Let me see if I can find it. Um, <sighs> is it the 21st or the 28th? I, I think it's the first. Yeah, I think it's the 21st. The 21st, okay. Yeah. We'll send out an announcement. Yeah. 
So Ronnie Phillips is, is an expert on um, uh, uh, the, the Chicago plan and, and the thinkers behind that, like Fisher and Douglas and, and some of the greatest American uh, economists from the 20s and the 30s. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to that one too. I'd like to thank everybody to sit it out for two hours here talking about money again. <laughs> I, I thank Dr. Castle very, very much. That was a wonderful and very inspiring and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, if everybody wants to clap, you can go to your reactions button <laughs> and there is a clapping. <laughs> or you just do like this. Can thank I, you very much. Can yes. I just say two things before I leave? Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am just so taken aback that people would take the time and spend, spend the time to really not only hear, but also learn about something that most, the rest of most of the country thinks is, is either unimportant or a kind of a magic box. And to sort of see a group of people that really are willing to recognize that banking is not just a product of economics, that it's also very much the product of politics and that it matters, that it's something that we should all be paying attention to that to do to and and that it's worthy of your attention i think is remarkable and i thank you for that and then the second thing i just want to say is you know i run an internship program in washington dc i just took over as the director of a program in dc and it's it's you know i i believe in it so much it's a chance for students to take what they've learned in the in the classroom and apply them Students take so many credits and so few of those credits give them a sense of actually how the world works or what the labor market is that they might enter. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving Ben the opportunity uh, to do something other than work in the classroom. I think he's appreciative. I know I'm appreciative. And at the end of the day, challenging him and challenging me is what makes education uh, work. And so I appreciate that. And I just wanna say, Thank you to all of you for those things. Thank you.